Kong. Ko Yu Jong's husband filed for divorce, citing spousal abuse as the reason. This led to a bitter custody battle, and in the end, she won custody of their son, although Kong was granted the right to visit him twice a month. However, Ko didn't allow her ex-husband to see their son, even after she remarried a civil servant in Cheju and moved with her new husband to Cheongju, North Chungcheong province, leaving her son in the care of her parents. Driven by desperation to see his child, he filed a domestic lawsuit against his ex-wife. The court ruled that Ko was in contempt of the law and ordered her to set a date to allow her ex-husband to see his son. On May 25, 2019, Ko returned to Jeju Island and met with her ex-husband at a vacation rental, finally allowing him to see his son for the first time in two years. However, what unfolded that day was beyond anyone's imagination. South Korea's strict privacy laws make it tough to find much information about Kong, so much so that even his full name isn't publicly known. However, it's understood that Kong was born around 1982 or 1983 on Jeju Island, South Korea's largest island formed by volcanic eruptions millions of years ago. Kong had a younger brother, three years his junior, and went to Jeju National University. That's where he met a woman named Ko Yu Jong, who we'll call Ko from now on. Ko, also a Jeju native, was the eldest of three siblings. Despite her parents divorcing when she was a child, a taboo topic in South Korea, her father remarried quickly. Ko and her siblings grew up in a relaxed lifestyle. Her father was a businessman, and as an adult, she occasionally worked at the family's car rental business. Ko studied chemistry at Jeju National University. At a university volunteer group, she met Kang, and they soon started dating. The Kong and Ko families got along great. In 2009, the younger siblings from both families won a government award in a script writing contest with Kong's help, who was passionate about writing. Kong also penned a script that earned Ko, her brother, and himself a State Cultural Foundation Award in 2012. After five years together, Kong and Ko tied the knot in 2013 and had a son. Those who knew Ko during this time described her as smart, and a sweet, caring partner. But the marriage didn't last long, and Ko soon showed a side to her personality that took everyone by surprise. In 2017, Kong filed for divorce, citing abuse from Ko. A friend of Kong later said that there were times when Ko got aggressive, even in front of their child. But Kong disliked speaking badly of her because she was the mother of his child. In response to her soon-to-be ex-husband's claims, Ko countered that Kong's alcohol addiction and frequent absences were the bigger issues in their marriage. To those who knew him, these accusations seemed suspicious, as Kong wasn't a drinker. Despite his limited financial means while pursuing a PhD, Kong deeply loved his son and fought for custody. Unfortunately, due to his financial situation, the authorities decided the child would be better off with his mother. The court ruled in Ko's favor but granted Kong visitation rights twice a month. Despite his financial struggles, Kong worked part-time and combined his earnings with his PhD research stipends to contribute about 400,000 Korean won, around $283, for child support each month. However, Ko refused to let him see his son. She wouldn't reply to his texts, and when Kong showed up at the house, she simply wouldn't open the door. On one occasion, even Kong's mother tried to speak with her former daughter-in-law to ask if the family could see the child. But Ko mocked them and ignored their pleas. Although he couldn't see his son, Kong continued to try to be part of his life. He always told people how proud he was of his boy. On special occasions, he sent gifts with the receipt included so the gift could be exchanged if it was something the boy already had or didn't like. After a while, Ko remarried. Her new husband was a public official from Jeju who also had a son from a previous marriage. The couple moved to the city of Cheongju. 
While she made a life with her new spouse, she left her son back on the island in the care of her parents. Initially, the Kong family didn't know that the boy had been practically abandoned by his mother. However, when they found out and tried to see him again, Ko continued to forbid it, even though she was thousands of kilometers away. Frustrated, Kong finally filed a complaint against his ex-wife. The court found that Ko had defied the law and ordered her to let Kong see his son, demanding that she set a date. On May 25, 2019, Ko returned to Jeju and met with Kong. She finally allowed him to see his son for the first time in two years. To celebrate, the father gifted his son a huge set of building blocks. The ex-spouses and their son spent the day at a theme park, then went to a supermarket to buy ingredients for cooking and returned to the vacation home Ko had rented for the occasion. Later on, Kong's brother would assert that the loving father was unaware that the plan included an overnight stay at a residence with his son and ex-partner. That night after dinner, the child went to play video games in another room, and Kong made a video call to his father, telling him how happy he was to have spent the day with his son. That was the last time they saw Kong alive. On May 27, Kong's brother was worried. The man hadn't contacted his family for two days after meeting with Ko and their son. He hadn't sent any pictures of the boy or shared any messages about the meeting. Fearing something bad had happened, the brother contacted the police that same afternoon. When the authorities called Ko, who was the last person to have contact with Kong, she began to cry. She told them that on the night of May 25th, Kong had attempted to sexually assault her and that after she resisted, he fled the residence. She claimed he never returned and added that she was afraid Kong would get away with it and escape any legal repercussions. The police asked her to come to the police station to make a formal statement, but she said she was no longer on the island. However, Ko mentioned that she had a text conversation with her ex-husband after he fled. According to Ko, she texted him saying she would report him, and he replied that he was sorry and was just shocked that she had remarried. A couple of hours later, Kong's family reported him as a missing person. Because of this report, the authorities treated the case as a disappearance, and the investigation focused on trying to find the man. According to the Jeju police chief, more than 90% of adult males reported missing return home voluntarily, so they are considered a low-risk group. After speaking again with Ko about the events of May 25th, the authorities visited the supermarket the family had been to that night. In the parking lot, they found Kong's car. They searched it for any tools or substances he might have used to take his own life, but found nothing. However, they did not conduct a thorough inspection of the vehicle and overlooked the car's black box. They also tracked Kong's cell phone to several miles away from the rented residence, but this discovery didn't lead anywhere either. As for the rented residence, the authorities initially did not inspect the house because it was occupied by other tenants. The place had no security cameras, so the police seemed to have hit a dead end and could not proceed with the disappearance investigation. Frustrated with the lack of police progress, Kong's brother decided to conduct his own investigation. On May 28th, he presented the authorities with security footage from a nearby building. This video showed Kong entering the residence with his ex-wife and son on May 25th, but he was not seen leaving again. Ko, on the other hand, left the residence with her son on the afternoon of May 26th and returned shortly after. She was seen leaving the house again on May 27th, the last day of her stay, carrying two carry-on suitcases and two black bags which she threw in the trash. According to the videos, King never left the residence. It was after receiving this footage from the man's brother that the authorities began to suspect that the case was not just about a missing person. On May 31st, 2019, four days after the Kong family filed the report, the police finally inspected the vacation residence to conduct a luminol test, which revealed latent blood traces. The test showed large stains on the bathroom floor, the living room, the kitchen, and the bedroom ceiling. Finally, the police turned their attention toward Ko. They later said that the woman had not given them any reason to suspect her as she had been very cooperative with the police and the information she had provided seemed correct. On June 1st, Ko was arrested at her residence, suspected of involvement in her ex-husband's murder. She appeared surprised when the officers took her into custody. 
Once she was under arrest, Ko changed her statement about what happened on the night of May 25th. She claimed that Kong had attacked her while she was cutting a watermelon and that she had defended herself with the knife she was holding at the time. However, she did not disclose the whereabouts of the victim's remains. On June 4th, the court issued an arrest warrant for Ko, valid until June 13th. The authorities needed to gather incriminating evidence against her or she would be released when this period expired. That same day, the forensic team was called to the crime scene where they took photographs and samples as evidence. However, when the owner of the residence discovered what was happening, he complained that the police presence was bad for his business and asked them to leave so he could conduct a deep cleaning. The police complied, preventing the possibility of returning to the scene for more samples. Later, the entire investigation process would be heavily criticized by the public. On June 5th, at a recycling plant in Incheon, bone remains were found that authorities believed could belong to the victim. At the insistence of Kong's family, the identity of Ko was revealed to the public. In Korea, due to the presumption of innocence and strict defamation laws, a suspect's face is normally covered on television and their identity is not revealed. However, a suspect's face can be shown under certain conditions. The suspect must be an adult, the crime must be violent and have caused severe harm, there must be sufficient evidence that the suspect is guilty, and it must be determined that revealing the identity is for the public good. That same day, Ko's second husband visited her in jail. During their conversation, she asked him if the police had taken her bag. This question seemed so odd to him that when he returned home, he checked his wife's belongings. That's how he found a prescription for Zolpidem in one of the bags the police had not searched. Zolpidem is a sedative used to treat insomnia. He immediately went to the police station and presented the drug as potential evidence. It wasn't until June 9th, four days before the arrest warrant was due to expire, that the police investigated the pharmacy that had prescribed the medication to Ko. The National Forensic Service of Korea had already expressed doubts about the usefulness of the small sample of Kong's blood they had. But when the lab processed it the next day, the results tested positive for Zolpidem. If Ko's second husband hadn't presented that evidence, the police wouldn't have known about the presence of the sedative and Ko might have been released. It was the discovery of the drug among her possessions that allowed it to be linked to Kong's demise. Upon investigating Ko's phone history, the police discovered that on May 9, 2019, after the court had forced her to choose a date for Kang to see his son, she had been making some revealing searches on the internet. Among the terms the suspects searched for were sedatives, lethal doses of nicotine, incinerators, grinders, bone weight, and travel bags. Then on May 17th, Ko was prescribed Zolpidem to treat her insomnia with a dosage meant for one week's treatment. Days later, on May 22nd, Security footage at a local supermarket captured Ko buying a knife, bleach, cleaning supplies, and rubber gloves. In her car, authorities found a saw along with other items used to commit the crime. According to the owner of the residence Ko rented, she insisted on not being disturbed during her stay. He also mentioned that he visited the property on the morning of May 27th and found Ko cleaning the place by herself. He noticed nothing unusual except for a broken pot and some missing towels. Since Ko did not provide a full confession, the police constructed a hypothesis of what they believed happened on the night of the crime. As previously mentioned, after returning from the theme park, Ko prepared dinner. Authorities presume that it was during this time she mixed the sedative into her ex-husband's food. Kong went to bed and managed to talk to his father around 8 in the evening but he didn't answer a call from his younger brother at 9.16 p.m., likely because the drug had taken effect. Ko told her son to keep playing video games in another room. According to the evidence and blood patterns, she repeatedly attacked Kong with a knife. The man woke up and ran towards the exit of the residence, passing through the kitchen before succumbing to his injuries. Around 9.50 that night, the property owner called. In the recording of that call, Ko could be heard telling her son to go to bed and that she would follow after cleaning up, all in a playful tone. The next day, the woman left the child at her parents' house before returning to the vacation rental, where authorities assume she dismembered the victim's body. Kong was not a small man. When Ko finished segmenting the remains, she distributed them into two carry-on bags. 
During the process, she injured her hand with the saw she was using. After leaving the residence, Co stopped at a nearby clinic to treat her wound. Around five in the afternoon on May 27th, Co fabricated the text conversation between her and Kong, which she later shared with the police. During the investigation, it was discovered that when authorities called her and she said she was no longer on the island, she was actually in a motel in Jeju. Then around nine in the evening on May 28th, while on a boat returning to the mainland, she was seen in a security video throwing trash bags into the sea for seven straight minutes. The next day, the woman arrived in the city of Gimpo, where her parents had an apartment. There, she disposed of more trash bags and also purchased more tools. Authorities suspected this purchase was for cutting the remaining parts of Kong into smaller pieces, which she threw away before driving back to her home on May 31st. The next day, she was arrested by the police. On June 12th, Ko was handed over to the prosecution. The trial began exactly two months later, on August 12, 2019. The case drew national attention, with people even traveling from different provinces to attend the trial. The court allowed public observers with a pass, which was handed out on a first-come, first-served basis. Concurrently with the murder trial of Kong, Ko's second husband, who was in the process of annulling their marriage, filed a lawsuit against her for the negligent death of his son, who was four years old at the time. The boy from a previous marriage lived with his mother. One day, Ko asked to visit the little boy at her house. And 48 hours later, the child died of asphyxiation. Originally, Ko's second husband was investigated in the case since he had been sleeping in the same bed as his son. It was suspected that he might have accidentally placed a leg over the child while asleep. However, he stated that the night before his son's death, Ko had prepared curry, just like on the night of May 25th when Kong was killed. Now, going back to the murder trial, according to experts, the curry had masked the bitter taste of the Zolpidem. The defense attempted to justify the incident by claiming that Kong was a sexual predator with a history of abuse who had tried to assault the accused. They also sought to garner sympathy for the accused by emphasizing that Ko was the only parent left for the child. The woman insisted that the crime was not premeditated. The public and media present in the courtroom strongly criticized these arguments. On the other hand, the prosecution presented evidence that undeniably implicated Ko. They showed tests of Zolpidem found in the victim's blood, which contradicted the story of it being a self-defense attack. They also presented evidence of Kong's blood found in the accused's car and on the saw used to mutilate his body. When the judges asked Ko if she wanted a jury trial, she declined. At a judicial hearing held in January 2020, the prosecutors requested the death penalty for Ko for the two alleged murders. However, the Jeju court acquitted the woman of the charge related to the child's death due to an inconsistency in the additional evidence. Ultimately, she was found guilty of murdering Kong, and it was noted that a severe sentence was inevitable because she had shown no remorse or empathy for her victim. Ko never revealed what had driven her to commit such a heinous crime, and Kong's family asserted that the woman had not said a single word to show she was genuinely remorseful, nor had she apologized. Since Ko's identity was revealed in June 2019, there had been a petition circulating for her to receive the death penalty, signed by more than 210,000 people, including Kong's younger brother. Despite public pressure for her execution, on February 20, 2020, Ko Yu Jong, aged 37, was sentenced to life imprisonment. Despite the efforts of the Korean authorities, Kong's remains were never recovered. In the absence of a body, his family held a funeral with seven strands of hair they collected from his favorite hat. In an emotional video, Kong's brother vowed to dedicate his life to fighting for the honor and memory of his older brother. The family also shared the last moments of Kong captured by the black box in his car. In the video, he is heard singing about how much he missed his son. The horrific actions of Ko not only deprived Kong's son of a loving father, whose only wish was to be present in his son's life, but also condemned him to grow up with the stigma of knowing that it was his own mother who committed the crime, making her one of the most infamous women in South Korea. And that wraps up today's case. 
If you like my content, don't hesitate to subscribe and like the video. See you next time on The Crime Storyteller. Goodbye.